Welcome to the State Correctional Institute at Graterford. It's Pennsylvania's largest maximum security prison. There are currently over 3,300 men in this maximum security prison. My name is Mike Lorenzo. I'm the Deputy Superintendent for Internal Security and I help manage this prison. Before I took this position, I was a member of the Philadelphia Police Department for 25 years. During my police career, I helped put some of these men behind these walls. I've seen firsthand what the impact of crime does to the victim, the victim's families, the suspect's families, and the community at large. The video you're about to see was developed by Image in an effort to help keep our youth and our young adults out of prison. These men want to share with you what prison life is like. It's not a scared straight type of video, but a fact of prison life video. They recognize how these, their incarceration has affected their lives, the lives of their families, friends, and their neighbors, and also the lives of the families, friends, and neighbors of their victims. They were all young men when they came to prison. They sat in the same classrooms, same churches, and some of the same homes that you're sitting in right now. They made some poor choices and it cost them their freedom. It only took several seconds in most cases to make a choice that they would pay for for the rest of their lives. They are older and wiser now and they want to share with you what it's been like to live in prison for the past 25 years. They want to spare you the pain and agony that you will put your families through, your victims' families through, and yourself through. They want to contribute something back to society to help keep people like you out of prison. Hello. Today we will be exploring a massive abandoned Murray. maximum security prison, which was built in 1929. As the state's largest correctional institution, it spread over 62 acres while surrounded by a nine meter perimeter wall. This facility held over 3,000 men in its various cell blocks, including its death row and restricted housing units. Various notorious names were held here, such as the rapper Meek Mill and cop killer Richard Poplowski. As we walk through what remains, you will hear the stories of men who spent most of their lives here, as well as see footage of the facility when it was still open. Join me as we see what's left inside. When I was, when I was younger, I never really thought about what I wanted to be. It wasn't until I got to the penitentiary is when I started realizing the potential I had to be a, somebody important or do things important. It wasn't until I got here is when I started saying, oh, damn, I could have did this, I could have did that, but it's too late now because I'm in the penitentiary. And I got a lot of time, I got a life sentence. And in Pennsylvania, there is no uh, getting out on a life sentence. So I'm here until I die. Because I was so young, I thought that it was, it was nothing they could do to me. That, yeah, I'm young, maybe they could send me away to a little home or something. I never thought that I would be in a penitentiary with grown men. But uh, that's, exactly where I ha that's exactly where I was at, at 17. And one year later, I was here. So, you know, I thought that they couldn't, but that's, that's, that's another false rumor that you hear that they can't do nothing to you because you're too young. Man, they would prosecute you and push you to the penitentiary at 13. And that's the truth. When I was 17 years old, me and another young man decided to snatch a woman's pocketbook. As a result of that, she fell, hit her head on the ground, and died. That was 27 years ago. That whole incident took less in 10 seconds to happen, I got tried as an adult. He got tried as a juvenile. He ended up doing maybe three years. 27 years later, I'm still here. We were two kids. We had a few scrapes with the law here and then nothing, no armed robberies or nothing like that. And, you know, Prank stuff. And you know, the next day I'm responsible for somebody being being dead. And and that that's that's something I'll never get over. Till the day I die, I'll never get over that. And somebody was minding their own business, going about their own life, and because of me, that life is over. 
When I came up here and looked down that hallway and looked and see how long it was and them gates closed behind me, my little heart pumped Kool-Aid. When I first came here, I came from the Youth Study Center and my heart was bumping. And every time the bus got close to the wall, the wall seemed small from a distance. But every time, I knew my life was over. Especially when they hit the back, when they hit the gate, I seen the guard in the tower with a shotgun. I knew it was over. 16 years old, and that's when my life ended. When, I, when my first day in here was the time, the day that I began to die. I was gripped in fear, you know, because when I first walked in this jail, and seeing how big this jail was, and I seen how many people was here, I couldn't believe it. Um, and then they take you to quarantine, and I mean, it's so much noise, and so much chaos, and so much confusion, and it's so much, so many things going on around you till you really never get a chance to collect your thoughts. I was put in a state prison, 17 years old, around state prisoners as a federal prisoner. And like I said, back then I just about shaved. And it was rough, because everybody's looking at you. And nowadays I know what it was. Even then I knew what it was, and I was scared. You know what I mean? It's like, guy's been in jail a long time, there's a young kid coming in, and uh, long hair back then. And uh, it was an eye opener. It was an eye opener. When I was seven years old, I was locked up in a home until I was nine. And then from 10 to 13. And then from 14 to 16. I got my first homicide at 17. I, I went to prison until I was, what, 21, Joe? 21. I got out. At the age of 22, I was accused of killing another person and was placed in prison, and I've been here ever since. So I guess from the age of seven years old, I've, I probably only have about two, maybe three years on the street. I'm what you call an institutional baby. I've been in prison all my life. This is where I live at. It's what they call C Block. This is my street. This is my neighborhood. This is my world. This right here is my cell. A156, right here. See that? That's my cell right there. This is where I live at, my cell. It's basically a six by nine foot box, concrete and steel. You can touch both sides of the wall. See that? You can touch both sides of the wall. This is where I live at. This is where I sleep. This is where I eat. This is where I drink. This is where I play. This is where I go to the bathroom. This is where my entire world exists, in a six by nine foot cell. Can you imagine living in a box, in a bathroom? Just go to your home, take the toilet out, and the bathtub, and put a bed in there. That's where you're gonna live for the rest of your life. That's what prison is like. In here, you will have a pair of browns and a pair of state boots. And if you're lucky, they might give you a pair of skippies. And you could cry. You could moan it don't fit, you're going to work. You're going to get up 6 o'clock in the morning for camp, and 6.30, 7 o'clock, you're going to come to work all day long. When you go back, ain't no rest, you're going to get up for count again. I produce this here. This is what I produce all day long. This is what I do. Search, D-O-C. D-O-C, spell it back with cash on deliver. That's what you will become. The minute you step in the receiving room, these people want to cuff you up, put you in blues. Six months later, you'll be running around here, pushing the broom, working. It ain't no laying around, I'm tired, I just came from school. Nah, you're going to get up for count. You're going to go to work. That's all you're going to do in here. For that, I'm let out for work. Maybe around 7 o'clock, I'm let out for work. My job consists of being a janitor, sweeping. If you, want, if, if you want to learn how to be the, a top janitor, this is the place to be. The one, thing they, the one thing they will teach you is how to sweep and mop floors and clean toilets. You can learn that in here. My job starts out at 
16 cent an hour. And well, I've been on my job the longest, so I, you know, for a long time. So I get paid the top pay. And man, it's a whooping 42 cents an hour, you know? And so I make approximately, uh, what, 40 some dollars, 50 some dollars a month. First thing in the morning, six o'clock in the morning, if I'm not already awake, I'm awakened by this loud siren that tells me I have to get up out of the bed, stand up at my door, and be counted. That's six o'clock in the morning. 20 minutes after that, I'm let out to go down and eat breakfast. Usually consisted of some kind of porridge or cereal, hot cereal, whatever. I can't begin to get into the food like that. Being locked up as a juvenile tricked me, faked me out. Because a lot of places I got locked up in, I, you know, they had mini bikes, they had horses and ping pong tables. And I was raised to believe that that's what prison life was all about. But then when I hit 17 and, and I hit the real penitentiary, and I was looking for horses and mini bikes. You know what I mean? I still have handcuffed things on my wrist from being handcuffed. Prison's no joke, man. I took prison as an educational stepping stone. I'm going to come to jail, toughen my game up, take it back out to the street. And uh, I'm 15 years later, I'm still trying to get out and do all that. And I'm never going to get out. The only way I'm going to get out is die. When I was a kid coming up, you know, um, I wanted to do all the things that I seen the guys on the corner doing. And I set out to do that. You know, I mean, I actually wanted to come to jail because I thought coming to jail was, was hit. I thought coming to jail would be like my right to passage. So I did things that I seen guys in my neighborhood do. To be honest, I wasn't close to my family because I was into so much out there. I wasn't close to my mother. Um, I remember when I came to prison, I came to prison in 1976. And in 1979, I had went up to Camp Hill. And during a visit, this is when I really realized just how much um, I was so far away, from, far away from my family as far as being, even though I was there on the street, I was so, so far away from, from them. Is when my mother had told me on a visit that she had told me that when I was home, she was, she, was, uh, she was paying on a tombstone for me. And here it is, I was only 14, and my mother was paying down on a tombstone for me. Because that was the things that I was doing out there, taking my mother through hell. I remember nights when I would come home, and i come in the house, and my mother, light still would be on, but as soon as I come in the house, she would turn the light off. And I asked her, why did she do that? She said, because when you came in, I knew you were safe that day. So this is where I got close with my family, in prison. I never thought about coming to prison because when I was home, prison was, prison was a joke because we would hear guys could come home from prison around the neighborhood and they would tell us about, you know, what's going on up there, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, you know, uh, so-and-so up there, he waiting to see you come up there. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's fun up there. <laughs> I'm telling you from experience, they were lying. They didn't tell me that when I had to lock up at nine o'clock that I'd be crying. They didn't tell me that why, since I've been away, I would lose family members. They didn't tell me none of that. You know, see, they'll tell you that what you want to hear or, the, or, or make themselves look big when they was here. But they're not going to tell you the reality of this, that this shit is hell. I look at myself as an idiot for being here. You know, I'm a fool for coming to Pensary so young, getting caught up in a system like this, you know, 
I'm a fool. That's no badge of honor, no badge of respect. Ain't nobody gonna respect me when I get out. Okay? You know, a, a sense of somebody that got sense and look at me like I'm a fool. I'm supposed to be somewhere else doing greater things with my life. This may be it for me that I may never get a chance to uh, live a normal life again. That um, what I would like to do in life is I won't be able to do it. I won't be able to have kids or get married. The simple things in life is for me now. Like when I was on the street, I always wanted to get the extravagant things and, and uh, live a life that is probably beyond my means. But now it's just a simple thing, being able to walk to the corner store to go see your mother. Uh, it's the little things now that uh, I, I think about now. Just not being able to live a normal life for me is that's that's what that's what bothers me the most. About it. You find yourself on a telephone calling home, or maybe to your so-called friends, and within a you know a couple months, you'll see that the phone's been shut off, can't call no more. You know, as far as getting visits, you might get them when you first come for the first couple months. After a while, it stops. You lose everything, you know? You find yourself writing letters. And then when it comes time for the officer here to come give out the mail, he just walks by your cell. Don't drop anything in. You see these phones? You know how you used to just going to the phone and getting on the phone and sitting down and being comfortable? All that's over with. When you get here, this is all the privacy you ever get. You're going to have guys walking all over the block, making a lot of noise, and you're not even going to be able to really listen to whatever you're talking about. You're going to have 15 minutes to say what you need to say on the phone, and all the while you're talking on the phone, somebody's going to be on there telling you this is a call from the State Correctional Institution at Graterford, and this call is being monitored. You know, you ain't going to have no more privacy because you lose all that. And another thing you're going to do, you're going to put a burden on your family because your family going to have to pay ridiculous phone prices for you to talk on the phone. You're going to have to pay to talk on this phone and you're paying to have somebody listen to you. You're paying, you know, like to be treated this way and, 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 and that's like, and nothing else you can do about it. You're in a restricted housing unit known as L unit. A restricted housing unit is commonly known as the whole or the RHU. Right now we have 128 cells. We can house 258 inmates, 256 inmates. We, this is for administrative custody, disciplinary status inmates. A disciplinary inmate, basically what that is, that an inmate that has violated the rules and regulations of the institution. Anything from using profane language to an employee, to being involved in something serious like an escape attempt, Rot cell thieves, uh, invol involuntary sex acts, predators. Uh, there's a whole variety of things. Unauthorized area. There's a lot of different reasons why an inmate can be a disciplinary status. Uh, we have a lot of mental health cases. They flood to tears. A lot of them have medical problems. Each one has to be dealt with in an in as an individual basis. We cannot categorize the inmate. We have to deal with them one on one. Inmates are in this area here or in their cells 23 hours a day, seven days a week. They're entitled to one hour of recreation if they choose. If they do not sign up and, and want to go to recreation, then they're in their cell 24 hours a day. If they're a disruptive inmate and we're a problematic inmate for safety, security reasons of the unit or the staff or other inmates, we can, we can deny access to the yard area on a, on a short-term basis, a day, day here, two days there. Or we can segregate them when they go into the yard. They go into the yard by themselves. They do not go with anyone else. There's a whole variety of things that can be done. These yard areas are more like a dog kennel. They have a roof on them. They have four walls. They have an opening where we can take the handcuffs on, a place to take the handcuffs off. All the doors will be locked with a security lock. The inmates will spend one hour in that area. They will be handcuffed, they will be stripped or searched, they will be taken back inside, placed in a cell, 
the handcuffs will be taken off and it will be strip searched. Pat them down. Currently in this institution, over on J Unit, we have 50 capital case inmates. By a capital case inmate, what I mean is the inmate has been sentenced by the courts to execution. The state of Pennsylvania uses lethal injection. All executions are done in a state correctional institution at Rockview by state law. The judge gave me a break when I was about just barely 15 and uh, she sent me to a juvenile facility, Cornwall Heights. I spent a little time at Cornwall Heights, I spent a little time at Glen Mills. I actually escaped from the Marius, and when I escaped, I continued to do crimes. I went back in front of the judge, and she told me, she warned me, she said, uh, if you continue to do these crimes, you continue to come in front of me, you'll be the youngest person in Graterford. Uh, of course, I didn't take it seriously at the time, and that's what she actually meant those words. And so I just continued to do what I knew best, you know, commit crimes and rip and run, until finally I found myself, um, you know, arrested and charged with, with matters, man, that um, would eventually lead to me being on death row. It didn't really dawn on me when I was given the death penalty, the, uh, the significance of having a death penalty. It didn't really dawn on me until I actually found myself on death row, which was in July of 91 when I went to death row. Uh, it's kind of hard to explain being down there, but uh, it's difficult, it's a difficult situation. Uh, if you're not used to isolation, you will have to get used to it because nobody is allowed to be in the cell with anybody else. Uh, a lot of the so-called things that we look at as luxuries in population, you don't even have down there. Uh, as far as all the way down to a toothbrush. Uh, your books are limited, your clothing supplies are limited. Everywhere you go, you're stripped, you're handcuffed behind your back. You're constantly being stripped. It doesn't matter if you're going around the corner to the law library or going around to a visit. I watched a lot of people down there deteriorate mentally, uh, physically. Uh, not being able to handle the situation of being on death row. It's, it's not something that you can just do. Uh, a lot of people may figure that a life sentence and a death sentence is close, but it's, it's not. It's, um, a death sentence is a, it's a psychological situation that you have to be able to deal with, psychological trauma. And unlike anything else, uh, the death penalty is it's something that each and every day you wake up, you remember you have it. You know, each and every time you get up out the bed, you remember you have the death penalty. And you're always wondering if you're ever going to get it up off you, uh, if you're actually going to be executed. Uh, each time we see suits come in the door, which are uh, considered to be uh, outside people or the warden or whatever, the first thing everybody's mind is, you know, somebody's warrant is signed. That's the sign that somebody's warrant is signed when you see the, the warden come in or the chaplain coming in together with the counselor. And uh, when that happens, it's like a hush that falls over the block because everybody's wondering whose warrant got signed, you know, whose warrant it was and if they're gonna get a stay this time or not. I really credit uh, a lot with the guys down there, it's kind of like a unity. You know, it's kind of, it's, like it's like a family down there. You have to have that because everybody needs each other down there. We all need each other in order to get through it. And um, each time uh, somebody gets their warrant signed, you feel like a part of your family is missing. It may come up missing for good. And um, so it, it puts a certain mindset, everybody in a certain mindset. Being out of there has been a uh, kind of serious adjustment for me. I've been out now about 
shortly, short of two months I've been out. And I'm um, still adjusting to population life, being able to walk around with our handcuffs on, being able to walk the child, being used to having everything brought to me for nine years. It's a little difficult to try to adjust automatically to your own sense of freedom. And after being down there for nine years, this is a sense of, sort of a sense of freedom to anybody that's been on death row for nine years. If that cell could talk, I guess from who, who was ever in that cell from when it was built in the 30s till now, it would tell a lot of stories, a lot of crying, I guess. And uh, I know I have a hard time when I see them like wheel someone out dead or OD, and that used to happen a whole lot. And you see, you know, all stiff and stuff, and you know that person. See, in prison, it's like uh, whatever your makeup is in life, in the street, if you got a weak moment, you can go away, no one sees it. But in prison, you don't have that luxury. You don't get away. So that weak moment or, or you know, you're not all right and something's wrong, it gets spotted in here. It's like this place, there's an, it's a magnifying glass you're under. And it's like when you go in that cell, you get a little time by yourself, but it's like it ain't, I wouldn't say it's ghosted that haunt you. It's you that haunts you. I think I've cried more in this place than I ever did as a baby. And, uh, I'm not ashamed to say that today, you know, because you're going to find that you're going to get here and you're going to feel so bad and so miserable about how you messed your life up that you're going to have to cry, no matter who you are. You know what I mean? The toughest guys, they tell you they don't cry. They lying, man. You know, your boys tell you they up here slinging and selling. They lying. They ain't doing none of that. I'm telling you, they ain't doing that shit, man. They're not doing it. It's not happening. You know, them guys is up here, man, fronting. And they're sending home, they're writing home, and they're telling you that this is happening, that's happening, but it's not. They're trying to tell you something that they, you know, they want to give you an impression that they're up here having fun and that they're really dealing with this situation. But we ain't dealing with this situation. We're dealing with it, but we're dealing with it in a way that you don't never want to find out about. You don't never really want to find out how, how I feel. You know, how, how, the, how I feel all the pain I feel. You know, how I feel about when I think about my mother. When my mother died, and I still can't go to the funeral or to the grave and say anything to my mom. Or when my brother just died. Me and my brother grew up together. My brother was two years older than me, and he just died last week. I wasn't able to go home. When people ask me, Earl, what do you miss about being on the street? I always tell them, climb in a tree, and it, it might, sound crazy. I'm a small town guy. But I miss that so much. Climbing a tree. I can't remember the last time I seen a tree, let alone climb one. And, and it's, 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 it's small things like that that you miss. The world's changing so fast that I have people in here that have been locked up for 30 years on a life sentence, that if I put them in a street, they would be so terrified, they would want to come back to jail because the world is completely, totally different. A lot of these people can't read, can't write. The only way they know how to get around in a city is because this bus is a certain color, that sign is over here, this store is over here. And in 20 and 30 years, that store is gone. They got different kind of buses now. The bus stop that used to be there isn't there. When you put them in a neighborhood they come from, the people have moved away. The people have grown old. It's a strange environment for them. It's culture shock. The same as when you get locked up and they take you off the street and put you in here. It's culture shock. You've never seen it. You've never experienced it. You don't know how to cope with it. You have the same thing when you go back out in the street if you've been here for a long time. I never thought that they would uh, send me to prison this long. I mean, I even was told, see the whole system is, is geared toward, uh, against you. And don't think that, you know, because you come to prison, you get a, you get a good lawyer that, you know, you're going to get off. Because I thought I had a good lawyer. And he told my mother and my family that I would be out when I was 21. 
I'm almost 40 years old. So you think about that. You know, I miss a few guys. You know, a few guys gonna get through the cracks. You know what, though? A whole lot of them guys that get through the cracks and get out, I seen them come back. I seen guys come here and stay here two years, you know, and run around here and act like they're having fun. You know, when they go home, and then you look in the newspaper, you re uh, look at the TV, and you see they, in, they, they done got locked up for killing somebody. And then I see them back here again, and they had the dumb look. I learned things the hard way. And I didn't have to learn things the hard way because I had a lot of people helping me and trying to tell me how to do the right thing. You know, I had 10 brothers and sisters, me being the youngest, and no one else in my family ever went to jail except for me. And the only reason I went to jail was because I wanted to do things my way. I wanted to be rebellious. I wanted to, you know, like, you know, the, the law, the street life got me, you know, and I got caught up in the moment and, you know, I got caught up in the seeing guys driving around in cars and girls and I got caught up in all that foolishness. And for a couple of days or for a couple of years, yeah, that might have been fun or I thought it was fun. But for those two years of what I thought was fun, don't add up to the last 21 years of this misery and this pain I have felt, and I continuously feel it. It's not a day that it go by that I don't feel pain, and it's not a day that go by that I'm not regretful about my past. When I was growing up, my only dream and my hope was to make it past 21. Because I seen a whole lot of my friends died at the age of 15, 14, 13, getting killed. So the kind of neighborhood I come from, it was no dreams of being a movie star or a singer. It was about making it throughout that day and throughout that year. If you made it throughout that year, then we throw a party for you in New Year. We celebrate that. But if you didn't, we take flowers to the graveyard. That's, that was the only hope I had. I had more dreams in prison than I had in the street. When I first got here, it might have been two, 300 guys, 21 years and under here. Man, the whole place is filled up with 21 years and under. And then old dudes are dinosaurs now. You know, this whole place consists of young kids your age and younger. This whole place consists of a whole lot of young kids that they made a mistake and got here and realized it's too late to change that mistake. This whole place consists of a bunch of guys that missed a whole lot of opportunities by standing on the corner and selling drugs and not going to school, and now they caught up in this system without an education. There's so many guys here, man, that's young, that's illiterate, can't read, can't write, and if somebody here don't help them or if they don't really try to learn why they're here, they're not gonna never learn it. If I could paint a picture of what prison looked like, you know, <laughs> you ever see, I would paint the ocean. A lot of water. Dark. As you look down on it, you will see spirals of darkness. Out of that water will come a big giant head. Mouth wide open. And as you see, you look into his mouth, you see all the hopelessness, all the, the disparity, all the gloom, all the darkness, all the shadows of non-life. And as it closes, the light that you might be looking at would be run, taken away from me. That's the picture I would say of prison.